All right, we are going to dive in. And today we're going to talk about the most important research on donor psychology that we think uh, is easily put in place to improve your outcomes this end of year. So uh, we'll be talking about a bunch of different studies and we'll talk about practical implications on what to do with those studies. Uh, and hopefully it's helpful to you. A couple of quick housekeeping notes as we get started. Uh, like all of the events, this one is approved for 1.0 CFRE credits. We've added a question to the survey to certify your participation. It is possible that CFRE audits are increasing, so make sure that you do this. Um, here's the agenda. Uh, just an important note as usual, the recording and slides will be sent around later today. Uh, some of you will still ask this in about 10 minutes. Please uh, help me out and let those folks know that yes, we will send around the recording and the slides for you to share with your friends, your colleagues, your loved ones, uh, but mostly your colleagues. All right, quick intros. My name is Patrick, uh, Patrick Schmidt. I'm lucky to be the co-founder and co-CEO of Free Will alongside my wonderful friend, Jenny Shias Bradling, pictured here. Jenny is all the way out in Seattle. Uh, I am uh, most often based in New York City, currently spending the last week in the very end of Long Island, all the way out here. So if you are in Montauk, uh, which many fewer people are than were say three weeks ago, give me a shout and we will go get some coffee and walk on the beach or uh, what have you. So let me know. Um, we are lucky to, as I mentioned, be the co-founders of Free Will. And Free Will is very fortunate to be the biggest estate planning company in America, which is sort of wild. And the biggest plan giving, most loved plan giving solution in the US, trusted by more than 1,600 leading nonprofit partners, ranging from the United Way and the, the American Heart Association and the Red Cross, all the way to some small uh, local animal shelters, which we love just as much. We have been lucky to be featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, named top philanthropist in the world by town and country, which is sort of crazy, AARP and others. Um, we are lucky to be part of a 200 person team that has raised more than $10 billion for nonprofits to date, including many of you. Uh, so if you're here, we love you. Thank you for doing this. And we have a lot of experience together. All right, on to the important parts. Uh, before we start, we are just so grateful to have you here to launch into fall, uh, to launch into end of year. I think that sort of post Labor Day, post summer turning to fall is really the beginning of end of year. Uh, and so as a thank you, we are going to send um, a book to 20 of you by Steven Pinker, the great author Steven Pinker, who I believe also wrote things like Our Better Angels, which is an amazing book about how much the world has improved over the last uh, couple thousand years, particularly over the last hundred. Um, but this one is a uh, won the LA Times Book Award uh, when it first came out. And it really just sort of helps you understand how we actually think. Uh, and so this should be useful to you in your fundraising, but also to better understand yourself, your spouse, your kids, your friends, uh, et cetera. So great book, highly recommend it. And fill out the survey at the end of the session and we will drop this for 20 folks. Um, okay, couple cool things to see. How's your week going? A little bit of a decline in happiness. Sometimes this happens around election season because many of you in your swing states are being barraged with ads, primarily negative right now. But good news, big increase in how people are feeling about hitting their goals compared to last week, which is excellent news. What have we seen? We've seen an increase in stock market performance in part because of lower interest rates. Uh, thanks to the Fed. So uh, we know that stock market performance is highly correlated with uh, end of year giving in particular. It also means things like stocks, donor advised funds, gifts from retirement accounts, et cetera, are even more important this year, right? But generally people are feeling bullish as you should. And hopefully some of these uh, skills and tactics and research that we can deploy into our work will help you hit those goals. So good on you for folks that are, are feeling a little bit better. Let's get right into it. We're going to talk about what makes us give, and then we're going to talk about what makes us give more, and then we're going to talk about what makes us keep giving, and we're going to pull specific research each time. So hopefully this is quite useful. Um, I will not be keeping an eye on the chat, but you can drop questions, and we will get to some questions at the end. So uh, scientists and researchers say there's fundamentally two reasons uh, for why people will give. One is we want to make a difference. Humans are biologically wired to be generous, according to the Cleveland Clinic. People are motivated by the desire to create positive change and contribute to the causes they care about. And giving provides a sense of purpose and connection to something bigger than ourselves. Right? So this is an important component. And a lot of this is driven by empathy. 
right? So this, this feeling of empathy drives a lot of behavior, um, in particularly in terms of charitable giving. We define empathy as the ability to emotionally understand what other people feel and see from their point of view. This is different than sympathy, which is I feel bad for you. Empathy is I have some sense of what you're feeling. It motivates and helps us predict what we call pro-social behavior. Pro-social is the act of helping others. The empathy altruism hypothesis suggests that when we see another in distress, they feel empathy, which motivates them to help, right? So if you see someone in distress, you can imagine what it's like to be in that situation, and that is what motivates you. This is research from the NIH and Frontiers Lab. Cognitive empathy and effective empathy, right? Understanding others' feelings, meaning I, I, can, I can mentally conceptualize what you're feeling, and then I actually feel your emotions when I see it influence behavior differently. Uh, many of you will experience this, obviously, on a daily basis. Um, and uh, you will experience this not just in your life, but when watching movies or reading books, when you can feel what the characters feel. Um, a 2019 study that we think is quite important from the Journal of Positive Psychology shows an increase in cognitive empathy predicted more charitable giving, right? So the more empathic that we can make people, the more they give. This study was on medical students' empathy, tracked over three years, presumably through survey data, and then charitable giving was measured afterwards. Long-term changes in empathy increased long-term pro-social actions like donating to charity. So how do we increase empathy? One thing is in our voice communications with other folks. So small intentional shifts in how we communicate with others can greatly affect our interactions. The feeling of others mostly of the time is largely out of control, but we can shape our donor relationships through subtle acts. So we'll talk about what those are. One of the most important is tone of voice will directly affect the outcome of your one-to-one -one donor calls. One of the interesting corollaries here in the research we see outside of fundraising is that many people can listen to 30 seconds of a surgeon talking and understand how likely it is for that surgeon to be sued for malpractice. And basically what happens is the less empathic the surgeon sounds, the more likely the patient is to sue that person. So what do we do, right? We want to show that a perception of interaction is everything. Our subtle tones can deepen bonds. This builds the bonds for routine check-ins. Before your next phone call to a donor, take three deep breaths. You can even practice it right now if you want to. But think about how are we going to be extra empathic to the donor, which then allows them to be extra empathic to the cause that we're talking about. One way to do this is you can try to match their pace and their tone for a better response. One thing that they saw showed uh, value for the surgeons was having a small bit of concern for the donor, right? So a little bit of anxiety. How are you doing? Is, there any, is everything going okay in your life, right? That sort of feeling of a little bit of concern, a little bit of empathy for the donor creates a much stronger connection uh, in a way that's quite useful. One thing we found fascinating in doing the research was that a 2017 study from Yale found that voice-only communication elicits greater empathy. Now, this is interesting, right? We're obviously on a video call right now, but it's quite possible that if we were on the phone and you could only hear my voice, you might have more empathy for the things that I'm saying. And so it's an interesting avenue. Uh, one thing that I think not enough folks are exploring, but if you have a, um, if you have phone numbers for folks, obviously you can text, but with your major donors, consider leaving a voice note. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, sort of breakthrough in terms of what's gonna get through a lot of clutter. Right, especially those of you, again, that are in swing states right now and we're thinking about end of year giving, how do we use things that are not necessarily being done otherwise to elicit greater response? So why else do we give, right? Obviously empathy uh, is, a, is a motivation, but what we call the warm glow feeling. So giving lights up the regions of our brains that process pleasure and reward. So the same way that you might, um, you know, the dopamine that might light up from uh, winning a slot machine or eating chocolate, right? Um, it's referred to warm glow giving. It's coined by Dr. James Andrioni. Research found that even when people are forced to give, their brains still show up this activity in the reward processing area. But when you choose to do so, it elicits an even stronger reaction. So the research at University of Oregon wanted to see if people gave out of a sense of altruism or if they gave to feel good. And each subject got $100. Some were taxed, meaning we said, okay, great, here's $100, but we're gonna take it 
and we're going to give it to a food bank. Others had a choice. Now, what happened is make on both cases, right? The folks who got $100 taken from them, sort of IE taxed, still felt good about the outcome. And you could see the reward centers light up. But the folks who chose to do it, their light up was to a greater degree. They got that warm glow. Um, what truly gives us drives us to give? The positive way giving makes us feel about ourselves that outweighs the desire to be altruistic, right? So part of this is building that when I give, it contributes to my own identity of myself as someone who gives. This is why um, those of you, again, coming back to the election, when you'll get, you'll get um, turn out the vote messaging and it will say, thank you for being a voter, not thank you for voting because it's appealing to that sense of identity. You are a voter as a person um, in an interesting way. One thing we like, and this is this goes into getting people to keep give, um, but when you, or keep giving, but when we wanna re-elicit the warm glow from an earlier time when someone gave, and we want them to give again, we love this tactic called the time traveler note. So let's say you have a lapsed donor named Michael who last gave in 2011. We're gonna send Michael this kind of note. Dear Michael, I was going through our records and I saw you made a really meaningful gift to our museum in September of 2011. September 24th to be exact. Now we're putting Michael back in the place he was. Thank you again for that generosity. That was certainly a different time. Barack Obama was still in his first term. Adele had just released her first album and the world barely ever used video chat. I'd be curious to better understand what motivated that gift. And I'd love to share how these resources have been put to use over the years. Would you mind if I gave you a call this week? Right. And so uh, keep an eye on that. I'm really interesting. Last time we shared this note, a couple of folks wrote to you, wrote to me after and said, hey, I just used it. And we just got a new gift from this lapsed donor. Uh, so we know that it works. Um, third, feelings influence finances. So 2004, a study out of Carnegie Mellon University, CMU, sought to understand the effects of our emotions on economic decisions. Participants were split into two groups, sellers and buyers. You don't need to understand the, the intricacies of the experiment to understand what we're getting at. Sellers were given a highlighter, a set of highlighters, and asked to set a selling price. And then buyers were shown the, the same highlighter and said, how much would I pay for this? Right. Now, before assigning the price, they watched film clips designed to induce feelings of disgust, sadness, or neutral emotions, right? So three difference, disgust, sadness, and neutral. And it measured how the, this, these emotional states influence the prices that participants assign to the object. To the object. They found that emotions do influence economic decisions as you are unsurprised to find out. In particular, disgust lowered both the assigned selling and buying prices. People wanted to check out of the experience, right? They wanted to, get, to be done with it. And so uh, that was not something that's gonna motivate more spending or more giving. Sadness lowered the selling prices, but actually raised the buying prices. And so there's some interesting dynamics there. Um, and that is uh, neutral videos had no effect as you might uh, not be surprised to find out. Um, similar to how uh, similar to how discussed lowered positive emotions, right? Or empathy can increase it. So if we can generate that emotion, we'll end up increasing likelihood to give and overall giving. So let's talk about what makes us give more. So there's another experiment back out of CMU. Thank you, Pittsburgh, for giving us all this great research. It featured two groups of shoppers at a grocery store. And upon entering the grocery store, we've talked about this a bunch because it's so important. They were asked two different questions. People in group one said, hey, show me what's in your wallet, like cash or credit card. What do you have in there? And the other group was asked to think about um, their bigger financial investments. Do you, do you own stocks? Do you own bonds? Do you own CDs? Before they started shopping. CDs meaning certificates of deposit, not compact discs, uh, just for the record. And what do we think the study found? Uh, what we realized is that customers who thought about their larger assets before shopping spent 60, excuse me, 36% more. Thinking about these larger assets led to higher spending independent of their actual wealth. When donors are reminded of their wealth, they're likely to give more. And this is a really key in terms of putting into action we pivot away from cash and checks and Venmo, and we want we ask for non-cash things like stock and crypto and donor advised funds and these gifts out of your retirement accounts called QCDs. 
It will help donors shift how they view their own giving capacity. And the fastest way to get someone to give more is to change the way they give. But a really interesting question here, a really interesting point here is this last thing. When we remind people of this, that they can give stock, when they can give out of their donor advised fund, when they can give out of their retirement account, it not only leads to more of those larger types of gifts, it also increases the size of cash gifts because people are mentally, mentally anchoring on something different than their income or what's in their wallet, right? So really, really interesting. Um, a link to non-cash giving types on your website in a prominent position will help normalize this. Uh, we recommend asking for DAFs, stocks, uh, QCDs, possibly even real estate, again, just to anchor on those very large gifts. Uh, in a normal email at end of year, you might say something like, have you considered making a gift of stock to the Red Cross to see even larger tax savings? Um, other interesting things in terms of giving people more, uh, we love this one because it takes basically no time to do and can dramatically increase your giving rates. So an experiment used 60,000 fundraising appeal letters from a hospital, and the standard response card used the three most common amounts, 10, 50, 100, or write in your own, and an alternate version added higher amounts. Would you like to give 10, 50, 100, 250, 500, or write in your own? Everything else about the letter was exactly the same. The audience was randomized, and so you can treat this as a true experiment. The result is that the second letter raised twice as much money, right? So everything happened exactly the same. And we just added these additional amounts to anchor people at a higher level. And the second letter raised twice as much money, meaning if you're not doing this, you're giving up half of what you could be getting. Uh, really uh, interesting. Another relatively strange version just worked, worked just as well as the second version. And that was said, do you want to give 10, 500 or something else? What's important here is having that high end amount. It is not the same as increasing all options. Why is that? Because if you if you if you increase the the smallest option from ten to ninety, it makes a smaller gift seem unacceptable, and you will get fewer gifts. So our big takeaway here is we want to keep a low option, but we want to have a really high option and make sure people understand that they can give a lot. Um, Valerie says we do A, B, and C, but vary it by the donor's giving history. Last gift equals A, and then you increase. This is a very smart thing to do if you have the technology to do so. All right, insight six, uh, as you might be unsurprised to know, we are heavily influenced by other people. Our need to belong drives human behavior to a considerable degree. And this is why the theory of social proof is so valuable. We are motivated to adopt behaviors similar to those around us. And in, in ambiguous circumstances, we turn to those around us for guidance on the right way to behave. If others cross a red light at a crosswalk, you might follow even though it goes against the rules. And if no one else was crossing that red light, you would probably stand there patiently waiting until it turned green, right? This is a really big emphasis on um, how people behave because at its core, humans are pack animals, and so we are instinctually led to, uh, to blend in. A Columbia Business School study examined the role that our peers have on charitable giving or pro-social behavior. University students who were given info about how peer donation rates, high or low, before being asked to donate, to tests of social comparisons, knowing the behavior of their peers influenced their own charitable giving, and of course, the answer is yes. Students were more likely to donate and they donated greater amounts when they believed others were doing the same. This, suggest, this supports the concept of what we call conditional cooperation. But what it means is that in practice, every time we are writing one of these emails or, or letters, uh, the main point to convey to donors is that they're part of a group. And even if you have better, even better if you have an example of a donor who opted for a non-cash gift, as you talk about, well, many other people are giving stocks. Is that something you're interested in? Many people give out of their donor advised fund. Is that something you would like to do? Um, so Sage says, any tips ahead of Giving Tuesday? We would suggest incorporating all of this into your Giving Tuesday messages. If possible, try to include a donor testimonial in your next piece of outreach. But otherwise, on a regular basis, use language like, Many of our donors, or most alumni, or most members of the museum, or many patients, right? Or be one of many, or donors like you are making a gift out of their IRA. 
right? I want to know what other people like me do because many people don't talk about their giving. And so they're looking for signals from the broader social group waiting to figure this out. So make a note on that as well. These are another things you can do that just small tweaks that really increase your ability to hit your goals. Insight number seven, uh, many of you know this, right? The, uh, what's the, what's the Marie Kondo book? The life-changing joy of tidying up, but simplifying our everyday lives help us focus on what brings us joy. Research shows that fewer choices help us conserve mental energy, and this helps feel increased levels of satisfaction and happiness. Um, to further prove this, Barry Schwartz, whose book became a surprise massive hit called The Paradox of Choice, says that fewer options reduce anxiety and make people feel more content with their decisions. It also encourages us to live in the moment, which increases overall happiness and reduces uh, stress. People are more likely to engage with things when they're simple and easy to follow. Um, in this psychology, this is referred to as the simplicity principle or Occam's razor. Um, when concepts are too complicated, they can be perceived as overwhelming and it makes it harder for people to connect with them. Just as an example, imagine asking your neighbor for a favor when you're on vacation. You might say, hey, can you water my plants once a day? And you will probably get a yes. If you said, can you water my plants every day? Use exactly two cups of water, check soil moisture, avoid watering after 3 p.m., rotate the plants every other day, uh, you will probably get a no. Now, one of the interesting things here is that if you need the plants to be rotated every other day, you ask first, can you water my plants? And then you get a yes and then you can follow up with more information. Great, thank you so much. I've left out a two cups of water measure uh, and here are some basic tips for it. The favor suddenly feels overwhelming when it's more complicated and they will say no when they otherwise would have said yes. Uh, this is by the way, another case for making giving extremely simple and straightforward on your, um, on your website. Don't do things like make people phone you for stock information when they're trying to give a stock gift. That is a, a simple way to lose gifts. Um, our word choice really matters when it comes to how donors give. And again, simplicity wins all the time. We have not covered that and we won't cover it in this session, but in our writing session, we talk about how emails written at a third grade level dramatically outperform those written at a college level, even to highly educated audiences. A study from our dear friend, Dr. Russell James shows that conversational family-oriented language triggers emotions tied to social bonding and generosity. And when we use things like contract terms, they trigger logical thinking and they deter giving. A uh, couple of examples here. In one experiment, identical descriptions of a charitable remainder trust were tested. One included make a transfer of assets and the other one simply said, make a gift. Interesting, interest in donating tripled with the phrasing, make a gift. Uh, other experiments around gift annuities. Many of you know what gift annuities are, but basically I give the charity a bunch of money up front, usually when I'm much older, and then they will pay me a certain amount for the rest of my life. Uh, that's the most common format. It used the same description, right? So the same sort of overall um, additional context on how it happened, but it said enter into a contract versus make a gift and interest quadrupled with the simpler language, right? So you have all this dynamic. In every case, removing technical terms increase donor interest significantly. Um, we always wanna opt for family language in speaking with donors, as opposed to things like making a transfer of assets. Say make a gift of assets. Instead of asking somebody to consider making a bequest gift to charity, say, try to make a gift to charity in your will. Ask yourself, this is a very good test. Would I use this phrase in a normal conversation with my grandmother? Or am I trying to seem really smart by using complicated terms? Nobody wants to know how smart you are. They want things to be as simple as possible for them. Uh, if not, right, if, if your grandmother's gonna be confused, please consider simplifying your ask. All right, more great research. Uh, a 2007 study aims to determine how personal stories of individual victims, and we can use victim quite loosely here, right? People that are affected by something um, or even animals that are affected by something with providing general statistics and how this impacts charitable giving. People donated significantly more when reading the story of one child suffering compared to statistics about starvation. And combining general stats with the child's story actually decreased donations, right? So there, there you can say there are many children, but you don't wanna get into 
sort of facts and figures. You want to say this child needs help. Your donation can help them and children like uh, him or her. So when we are doing appeals, we are going to highlight a singular story. Think about how your mission impacts the life of one person uh, or one animal or even one plot of land. Share the story so that it's clear to the listener or reader what the results of that donation will be and keep the narrative simple. One person, one transformation. It is even better if you have approval to highlight a real person your organization has helped, but you can always talk uh, sort of broadly about, let me tell you a story about of one kid that came to our school last year. Um, if your mission isn't that straightforward, put yourself in the position of a donor. Ask yourself what impact the organization does have on one person, one community, one species, of animal. Um, meet Sarah. Her life was forever changed because of your support. This is Bella, a once homeless dog, now in a loving home because of your contributions. Your gift gave hope to one family and their story begins with you, right? These are really, um, these are really powerful. Again, some of you will think, well, I don't, you know, I don't do that specific piece. Think almost certainly you have impact on one person at a time, even if you are, say, a museum, right? You can talk about um, one child in one school group that came to visit uh, or something similar, one artist that was given an extra chance because of it, um, whatever it may be. Uh, what makes us keep giving? So we asked you, what do donors give to, why do organizations, excuse me, why do donors give to your organization? And 90% say they believe in the organization's missions and values. 67% say they want to make tangible impact. 70% say the personal connection. 47% says giving makes them feel good. 37% said they're motivated by tax benefits or financial incentives, and 6% said, hey, I just don't know. Thanks for being honest. Um, the answer is that most of these are likely to be true, right, for across the board. But one additional piece of interest here is that metrics guide donor decisions. So a 2022 study at uh, our alma mater, Stanford, sought to figure out how impact data influences donors' decision to give. The study tested how standardized objective metrics impact donation behavior versus a good fundraising pitch. Participants were shown hypothetical charities and given the option to donate $5. Donors who saw comparable metrics were 80% more likely to choose the most effective charity. Metrics did not increase the amount donated, although the authors note this might have been different had they been given more than $5 in the survey. But overall, when donors are provided with data on charity's impact, it leads to more gifts. Let's talk about this for a second before we get on to the next tip, because we just talked about the single story, and now we're talking about impact. Uh, what I think is the most valuable thing you can say is that people are really trying to make sure that they made the right choice in giving to you. So, you know, you want to say something like um, other outside folks have called our, our organization the top museum or the, the highest impact in terms of child poverty or whatever it may be. Anything you have that says this is the superlative organization working on this or even we have a four-star rating on GuideStar or Charity Navigator, so you can trust that all the money is going to the impact that you want it to. Things like that will go a really long way. We just want people to be extra sure in their decision that the gift that they're making is gonna make a real difference. That leads us to our next tip, which is Google your nonprofit. When is the last time you just typed in your own nonprofit on Google? Um, what are donors seeing when they look for you? This is especially important at year end when traffic to your site is at an all time high. Make sure that any public site donors refer to any public sites that donors refer to, such as Charity Navigator or Candid, formerly GuideStar, are up to date. They should positively and accurately reflect the work of your organization, especially for new donors who might be interested in a particular cause but are trying to figure out whether or not you are the right fit. There are 1.8 million nonprofits in the United States right now. And so they should get a good idea from your website and or a reputable source about your mission and your impact. If you don't, they will give to an organization that does. And so you want to make sure that you have this. One more tip, uh, as we think about the warm glow, uh, alongside the time travel note, one of my other very favorite things to do in terms of stewarding donors, uh, which we will cover much more in a future session, is what we call the surprise thinking of you note. So the thinking of you note out of the blue is particularly effective for making you long-term memorable to an organization. The element of surprise creates emotional resonance and surprise often increases pleasure in the pleasure centers of the brain in a given moment. Um, the area of the brain associated with pleasure and reward expectation responds most strongly to unexpected events. If I hand you $20 and I told you yesterday I would hand you $20, you would feel good. 
If I walked up to you and handed you $20, your brain would light up like a carnival. If you didn't know it was coming, it would be very exciting to you. So the thinking of you note falls into the second category. In research, uh, you can go read the full article in 2022, a New York Times, should we underestimate the power of the general check-in, especially when it's a surprise? Across 13 studies, participants vastly underestimated how much joy would be created from a casual reach out from someone they sort of know, or not their very closest friends, um, but random folks. The joy was stronger from weak ties as opposed to best friends. Think, hey, that person you were pretty close in high school with, but don't really talk too much now. Or a former coworker that you don't really used to see every day, and maybe you got lunch a lot, but now you don't talk to. These are the reach outs that can spark a ton of joy. Now you as a fundraiser also fall in that category. You are not their best friend, but you are someone that they've had some relationship with in the past. And so let's talk about the thinking of you note, which is gonna make someone's day. Oh, and by the way, it takes about 60 seconds to write. So if you have major donors, I would do this twice a year uh, in basically no time at all, but really, really make their day. So here's an example. Uh, the subject is thinking of you. Remember uh, in our writing context, we want subject lines that everyone is definitely gonna open. If I send you a subject line that says thinking of you, you will 100% open it. Um, Alex, I had a moment today that I couldn't wait to share with you. While strolling through the Arboretum, I stumbled upon a little girl and her grandfather both engrossed in a bird watching session. The grandfather shared with me they started a tradition of spotting new bird species together every week. Remember the bird sanctuary initiative you and Jamie supported last summer? This is just one of the countless heartwarming scenes it's been fostering. I thought you'd like to know the happiness you're bringing to many by being a philanthropist. I hope you're having a great day. Okay, what did we do here? One, surprise, right? So the surprise element plays a huge role. We are sharing one specific piece of impact. You could write, Alex, 5,000 people have been through the, the bird sanctuary initiative. That's not as helpful as Alex can picture this little girl holding her grandfather's hand, pointing out, you know, a yellow-tailed warbler or whatever it may be, and suddenly you can really be have that empathy to, to build that warm glow again. Now, one of the last things it says is, I thought you'd like to know the happiness you're bringing to many by being a philanthropist. Now, instead, we didn't say by giving, we said by being a philanthropist, and this builds Alex's identity as someone who gives, and he's much more likely, or she, I don't know what the gender of this hypothetical person is, is much more likely to uh, to give in the future, right? So give that a shot, um, try it out um, and go from there. Um, another thing that we, we don't have an example here, I don't believe, um, but you can also do this as a text message. You can even do it, remember, as a voice note. So try one of these this week with your major or mid-tier donors. It's super easy. Um, this literally took us about 50 seconds to write uh, and it's just a great thing to receive. Um, okay, so we are wrapping up a little bit early today, but we gave you a ton of, this was a, a very content heavy session. So we wanted to not overburden you with only about 20 different uh, resources and studies that we dove through. So my colleague Phoebe, uh, thank you Phoebe so much, just pasted in the chat um, a link to the survey. So please take 30 seconds right now to click on that link uh, before doing anything else, click on that link and fill out the survey. Uh, one of the most important things here is that we're going to send a copy of How the Mind Works by Steven Pinker to 20 people as a gift. Um, make a note in the survey if you'd like a chance to get a copy, tell us where to send it. So uh, please also include your address, that way we can send it to you. So please do that. On Thursday, so in two days from now, we are doing what we call a strategy showcase. We started doing these a few months ago and they have been wildly popular. And you hear from people that are mostly not me, although I will be there uh, helping out to intro. And we have a, a, a panel of four experts talking about how to make the most out of in-person events. So if you have a gala or an end of year event or anything similar, or you're already planning one for spring, this is a session for you. And we're gonna talk specifically about how do we get these larger non-cash gifts in person? So how do you walk out of there with a $10,000 stock gift instead of a $300 cash gift? So uh, we will do that. We'll also share some of um, some of the tools that people are using, technology around these non-cash gifts. So please come join us there. Uh, Anna, Erica, Abigail, and Aileen, they are brilliant. Uh, and you would, you will, I promise you, you will have a great time. So come join us on Thursday if you can. Uh, we are getting some questions as to whether we are gonna get a recording. Yes, you will get a recording and the slides. 
Um, okay, so we will do a few minutes of Q&A, but we will not go the full hour. And um, one final announcement here is that October 8th, we're gonna do a really deep dive in terms of driving up average gift sizes at end of year. Um, if you are not about to recruit a ton of new donors, getting larger gifts from your existing donors is the number one strategy to hit your goals this year. And so we will do a really, really deep dive there. Uh, we'll talk about it for different generations. We'll talk about different gift types. We'll talk about how to make it not overwhelming for you or your donors, and instead make it easy in a way that, that lets them continue to do this uh, year after year after year. So um, let's, uh, if you, so that's that. We're gonna do a few minutes of survey, excuse me, of questions, and then we will wrap up a little bit early. But um, thank you all for being here. Uh, we're just really, really grateful. And then before I get to questions, um, particular thank you to Phoebe, who's on the call, who put a ton of work into researching the research, pulling together all of the most important studies. So thank you, Phoebe. Um, also, Phoebe was just promoted at Free Will. So big congrats to Phoebe as well. Um, so big shout out, Phoebe. Thank you so much. And everyone else at Free Will who's making this possible. Um, all right. Um, Judy says, since voice only communications elicits greater empathy, would you say audio, audio stories of impact would be better than visual and or audio videos? I'm working on a project that is only audio and this will make me more confident in our strategy. Judy, that's what the research says. So again, the Yale research showed that people had greater feelings of empathy from audio only than video, which is interesting. Um, and that's, this is in a one-on-one -on -one communication, right? So it's not necessarily saying that um, a podcast is more emotive than a, than a feature film, but uh, it is something that's quite interesting um, and we'd love to hear more about it. But I do think that that you're probably doing um, some great work over there. Also, audio only tends to be a little bit easier than video and audio, so give that a shot. Um, Carolyn says, Carolyn asks about um, the, the suggested gift amounts we talked to when we said 10, 50, you know, 25. And she said, um, does anyone know any research about orders? Do you, do you order the highest gifts first or the lowest gifts first? I'm actually not sure, Carolyn, but if anyone has, has experience in terms of, are you putting the highest gifts first or the lowest gifts first? Um, please, please put those in the chat as well. Uh, Ahmed says, can suggesting that many other donors are contributing unintentionally give the impression that my contribution isn't crucial or necessary? Uh, Ahmed, that is, a, um, that is a reasonable thing to believe that the research shows us is incorrect. So if you say only a few people are going to donate this year, please do it. What that signals to the brain is, oh, this isn't something that people like me do. So I can probably skip it as well. Um, so good, good question. Um, Marjorie says, some of these studies are several years old. Is this still true post-COVID in new generations? Marjorie, most of this research um, tends to be true for, for centuries, frankly. Um, the human brain doesn't, doesn't shift that much. And so, uh, yes, I think it's a fair, I mean, obviously we'd always be want to rerun these, but I think it's a fair assumption that most of these things will still be true. So great question. Thank you for asking that. I'm sure, um, I'm, I'm sure other people are thinking that as well. Um, Pamela says, we are an arts nonprofit and we are experiencing decreased giving in a busy election season. What are some tips for getting through the crowd, especially when there are more potentially urgent needs? So Pamela, a couple of things stand out, right? Um, we didn't talk about it, but there's something called the reciprocity effect. So if you do personalized outreach while other people are getting deluged with direct mail and TV ads and robocalls, that will go a long way. And it will really help you stand out from the sort of mass marketing that is typical of the election and political campaigns. Um, other things you might want to do is highlight the contrast, right? Uh, need a moment of peace? Come to the museum, right? And just uh, something like that. Uh, that is a uh, interesting avenue. Um, Deb says, do you recommend emails thinking of you over handwritten notes? Uh, this is a good question. So I would, I would typically think about. I mean, handwritten notes are great if you can do it. Um, 
and, and most people just don't take the time to, if you can do a handwritten note on the thinking of you, it will probably stand out even more. I think one of the things about the email is that it feels like you just saw it and you dashed it off. You couldn't wait to tell them. Um, and so that tends to be, uh, tends to be quite valuable. One other small note is that I find that people are more receptive to uh, when you when you get a note, think about, you know, handwritten note, you can also do um, a sort of typewriter font that people have and hand sign it. And that, that can be quite useful in, in part because some people's handwriting is just not that good. And people I think are frankly getting worse at reading cursive as we read fewer and fewer handwritten notes. And so it's an interesting avenue. Um, Sundi says, I actually think actually text thinking of you text if I have their cell number. Um, Sundi, that's a great idea. So we strongly encourage this sort of, it, it just has to feel like, oh, I just walked by. You know, sometimes your friends will do this. Hey, I just walked by that place where we had a great dinner three years ago, or, you know, remember we had this experience here. I just thought of you. And it's really nice to, to do that. Um, great, great information. Um, Regina says, what do you think about birthday cards? Um, birthday cards are great. Um, birthday cards are great. One of the things we like the thinking, think, excuse me, the thinking of you card a little bit better than birthday cards. And that's because there's less noise on a given day, right? When it's your birthday, hopefully you're deluged with uh, well wishes. And so it's nice to get that. It always feels a little silly when, you know, you get emails from like the days in you stayed in three years ago and said, Patrick, happy birthday. You know, they just sort of in the system. Um, but if you can make it really heartfelt, it can be quite, quite useful. All right, so we'll pause there. We'll give everybody 15 minutes um, uh, back. And we were in a little bit early. If you haven't already, please fill out that survey uh, that we noted in the chat. Uh, thank you, Phoebe, just pan uh, paste it again. We hope this was useful. We tried not to overwhelm you, but obviously there is a ton of, um, uh, a ton of content here. Um, we're just really rooting for you as you go into the last four months of the year, three and a half at this point maybe even less. Oh boy, it's coming quickly. Um, and please let us know if we can do anything to help. Um, you can reach me at patrick at freewill.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm very easy to find. Uh, we'd love to see you on Thursday. Uh, we'd love to see you on October 8th, how to increase uh, gift size this end of year with non-cash giving. Also love, um, if you're interested, go to the freewill.com website and click on the four nonprofits up at the top. We'd love to work with you. So I will just put that ask out there. If you haven't already, at least consider it. Uh, we'd love to team up with you to raise tons of money for your organization. And we will talk to you all very soon. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much.